Hi, everyone. I'm Pascal Hansen, CEO and financial strategist at Zeta, a business advisory firm created to help business owners achieve more. And we help them do that through business planning, education, and consulting. Now, what follows is an excerpt of a conversation that I had with Mike Hardy about corporate selling. I divided it into three topics that we discussed, prospecting, handling objections, and closing. So what follows is the segment on handling objections, or as Mike prefers to say, discussing concerns, and you'll hear why he says that. I hope you enjoy the conversation. I definitely think there's some nuggets of uh, information there that you can share with your sales team. It doesn't matter what the size of your sales team is. And one reason I think it's of such value is because of Mike's track record. So I've been in corporate sales for decades, and he is the only sales professional I know that has consistently not only been over his sales quota, but done so in Q1 in every single company that he worked for. So this is across multiple industries. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Today, I'm delighted to have my friend and ex-colleague Mike Hardy with me. So Mike Hardy is not only a friend, but he's someone that I learned from on a continuous basis. I first met Mike when I worked at American Express and he was a voice on the phone. He had called me, he was based in Toronto, still is, and he had called me because he was considering joining the sales team. So he had many years of experience being behind the scenes in the finance department. So great with numbers, which is a huge asset in sales. So he wanted to have a conversation with me, pick my brain. And I'm always one to support people's goals and ambitious ambitions. But I thought I would give him maybe the not too fun part of sales, not to deter him, but just so that he could have a realistic picture of what that is. So I didn't want him to accept a role in sales, just thinking, oh, it's fun, front of line, and you get to you know, do all the fun stuff, network and take people to events and travel with clients and all that fun stuff. I should say that we were at American Express on the corporate travel side of the business, not the credit cards. And so I had a conversation with him and I saw he sounds very confident. Didn't know much else about him until we were at the same sales conference. So that particular year, American Express as a corporation had decided to adopt the sales practices from the Challenger Sale. It's a book. And in short, it was really about selling through education. And so we had all met in Toronto. We were going to practice as a team. And when Mike stood up to give his presentation, I think he had one or two slides. They were very simple, not busy slides at all. And he just nailed the value proposition so well. And even though it's corporate sales, can be very complicated. And I was so impressed. I just looked at it and I went, wow. Who is this person? Clearly someone I have to learn from, and I have been ever since. And what I particularly like about Mike is that he has done and does what is difficult for a lot of salespeople, and that is to be consistently above quota. And so lots to learn from him. And so I have asked him to come and share his wisdom with the audience. And today we're going to speak about handling objections. So I know from having been a sales manager, having been in sales for 20 years myself, a lot of people find that to be the hardest part. In my personal view, the selling doesn't start until you get your first objection. So handling objections, closing are um, a difficulty for a lot of people, especially if you're new to sales. So thanks, Mike, for being with us. I appreciate it. Okay, and stop blushing now. Um... You, you spoke way too highly of me, but no, thank you for having me. This is really exciting. So tell um, us, yeah, so tell us, what do you, so when it comes to handling objections, share some best practices with us, please. So I think when it comes to objections, I think it's really a good idea to look at that there are really three types of objections. We'll only focus on one because we have limited time, but those three different objectives, prospecting objectives, which we'll talk about today, uh, red herring objections, basically it happens almost in every other meeting it feels like these days. Basically relevant topics or issues that people are throwing out there to try and divert attention. 
the typical, oh, we used you in the past and you weren't that good. So how do you handle those? Um, and the last one, I call it next steps, objections. Some people call it commitments, objections. But while you're in that sales process and you're asking to move forward, how do you handle those objections when they do come up? Because at that point, it's a little bit of a different objection than what you're getting at the very beginning of the call. So I think um, when I'm looking at objections as well, so now that we've defined those three, um, the three main sections, sorry, my brain only thinks in threes, but the three main sections that I look at is, can we change the name of objections? So we'll talk about that a little bit. How to structure your response to an objection. This is really where we'll spend a lot of the meat and potatoes. And then last but not least, um, why are you getting these objections in the first place? I think it's part of the objection process that a lot of people don't look at. So I don't know if those sound good for you, Pascal, but if you're good with that, we can dive into it a bit. Yeah, no, and I like your, your second one. So I do think that's key is like, why are they giving me an objection? So I think, and I'm looking forward to your answer, but I think a lot of times people don't ask enough good questions, whether that's in the sales process or not, because people will say something and their body language and their eyes are saying something else. So to me, that's always... I've got to ask more questions and do a deeper dive because I don't believe what your mouth is telling me. There's some other reason. Sometimes it's purely emotional and has nothing mm -hmm. to do with what the conversation is about. Oh, hundred percent. So yeah, we'll definitely jump into that. as the last one, but we'll bounce some ideas off of each other. I totally agree with everything that you just said. I'll just be honest, and you kind of touched upon it at the introduction. I had a hard time with objection handling at the beginning of my career. I came from corporate finance. Most people who know corporate finance, yes, I'm that person who likes to sit in front of an Excel spreadsheet. I'm not very extroverted. I'm a very introverted person. So hearing the word objection scared me. I think that's why we need to change the word objections. Because when you hear objections, you hear adversarial, right or wrong. I think of courtrooms you know i have an objection death or not death jail or no jail time the word alone freaks people out um so when i started looking at it i went okay what can we do can we change the name of the objection because re objections it's really it's not rejection um it's more of a sign of a confusion it's a sign of their fear of change um in most cases I like to call it concerns because at the end of the day, what it is, is it's a question or concern that they have at that particular point in time. And when it's a con question or concern, it's a dialogue. It's something I can help engage with. When it's an objection and it feels like rejection and that rejection does feel real, it's harder to swallow. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. No, I like that differentiation. Yeah, no, I'd much rather talk about your concern than you objecting because that's, yeah, that's very negative connotation on both ends of that. Yeah. Yeah, so I had to really get over the mindset of, okay, it's not an objection that I'm getting. They're not rejecting me. They don't know me. It's nothing personal. I have not shown maybe enough value to warrant the ask that I'm asking for. So once I got over that, it allowed me to go, okay, now that I can swallow or, <laughs> or at least um, take on an objection, what do I do? Because there isn't a school that teaches you how to do sales, unless you're gonna read a ton of books, which unfortunately or fortunately I have done, or unless you're gonna take outside private courses, there's no university or college course that's gonna help you with sales. So what I did is I said, okay, I'm going to be facing these objections. The reality is I'm going to hear no, and I'm going to hear no a lot. That's just the reality of sales. So I went to myself, I said, okay, well, how many times can a prospect say no? So this is now how do we structure our response to the objection? Because the objection is coming. So I literally, for the first probably, and don't tell our old boss this, for the first three months of my sales career, I had a sheet. And every time I asked someone for a meeting and they said no, I asked, I wrote down why they said no. I was too afraid to respond to it, but I asked, I wrote it down. You know, it's, we don't have it. I don't have enough time. We're already with another provider. We use so-and-so. You guys are too expensive. There are only so many different ways of saying no. So I wrote them all down and I went, hey, I'm noticing that there's a pattern here. Now I bunched them into patterns. I said, okay. So really all I'm hearing is I'm either happy with my current provider, I don't have time, 
you're too expensive, I don't have budget. The infamous, mail me some information. So now that that's the objection that I know I'm going to face. Now, how do I plan my response? I don't know what your thoughts are on that. No, I, I would do the same thing. So um, one particular company I remember going into, and I didn't want to wait until I got the, the corporate training to really know what I was selling. So I knew I already had the network. So I went to the top salesperson going, can you help me? And what are the objections you get? Like, do you have a cheat sheet? And he had done the same mm -hmm. thing. So I said, oh, send it to me. We went through it together. And so I would be on the phone and literally going through a script. Um, and then when I did get my first sale, I didn't really know the back end yet because I didn't been trained on it. I was just talking on the phone. <laughs> so then it's like, okay, uh, I got my first client. Now what? And yeah. I just threw myself in and learned as I went because I couldn't wait three months to get trained to start making commission. So, um, yeah, so that's always been my starting point. Well, and in a lot of cases, we don't have three months, right? And it's putting yourself out there asking the question, be ready for the objection, but also realizing that when it comes down to it, they've really only got about five or six real objections that they have. They might say them in different ways, but yeah. they all mean the same thing. So now that I go, okay, I know what these objections are. Now I'm going to formulate because again, you know me, I like processes. I said, okay, so what's a process I could put in place that I can confidently handle these objections? So Again, in threes, you're going to see a pattern with me. My brain doesn't go past three. Sometimes it gets to five. I like um, simplicity. But I, I like simplicity. <laughs> but, I, but I have what I call my three-part process. And I'm doing this right now with WestJet as well, to be honest with you, because I just joined last May. So first off, it's what I call the pause. And I won't go into it because I know if anyone's listened to podcast, which your audience is, self-help, development. They all know about this lovely lizard brain called the amygdala. I will not go into detail on what that is, but we need to be able to pause to be able to allow our logical brain to catch up. So that pause when it comes to objections can be something as easy as excellent. And just sitting there, it's something reflexive that you can say automatically. When you ask me a question and I say, that's a great question, I'm pausing. I'm waiting for my logical brain to catch up. We need to figure out what we can say automatically in the heat of an objection that we don't need to think about that allows our brain to catch up. That's the first thing that I put into place. Second way, you got to remember that these people take phone calls and emails from salespeople at nauseam. When they see a pattern, they repeat the pattern. If you can disrupt the pattern, they actually perk up and they listen. I'm probably a strange person when it comes to this, but the reality is my next line is instead of arguing with them, because I am convinced that you can't argue people into believing that they're wrong, I agree with their objection. It brings down their guard. That's a good so one. Yeah. So when the, I'll use an example, because everyone now knows I work at WestJet, I call, oh no, we're already with Air Canada. I say, oh, that's great. A lot of the companies I call work with Air Canada, they're a good company. But I still think that there's a place where we can provide value. Do you have 20 minutes in two weeks time for us to get together? Yeah, now you pique their interest. Uh, I pique their interest. Because if that was me, I'd be like, oh, okay, well, how can you add value? You already know I'm with someone else. I'm probably not going to leave them. What are you going to do for me? It brings down the people's guard. It made you listen because I actually agreed with you. And it puts you in a place where you're not feeling that this is an adversarial type of interaction where I'm going to beat you down into taking West yet. No, we're going to have a conversation to see if we're a good fit. And then the hardest part for most people, especially Canadians, ask again. Ask for that meeting again. I just had a coaching call with somebody that's a friend of ours, mutual friend of ours on sales. And I gave him my line that I give most people force them to say no twice. You're right. going to hear no anyways. Be ready for that first no. That first no is a prospecting no. Yeah. Get them to say no a second time. Give you an example. I'm traveling. I lost a cord for charging my phone. I walk into a, a um, business depot or whatever, it's Staples. Mm -hmm. And what does a person say? Hey, can I help you? I say, no, I'm fine. I'm just shopping. Who's just shopping in a Staples? 
I needed a cable. <laughs> but I'm so reflexive. I say no. Yeah. I need help. But I, I just said no because they gave me the pattern that I'm used to seeing, yeah. which is, hi, how can I help you? If they said, hey, what brings you in here today? I probably would have said, give me a cable. So this is why, again, that disruption part comes in. But every time you call, every time you reach out, we are trained to reflexively say no to everything. That's true. Force, force them to say no a second time. Give you an example. You know, I say, give my spiel, my little prospecting spiel. And you respond with, no, you know what? I just don't have any time right now. You know what? You're not the first person who's told me that. There's a lot of people wearing multiple hats these days, and we all have a lot of things on our plate. I wouldn't be calling you if I didn't think I can add value. How do you look two weeks from now for a 20-minute meeting? I'll take the meeting. <laughs> but you get what I mean. Yeah, I do. You, yeah. They've said no. You're forcing them to say no again. And then what I told tell everyone else, and this is just my style, doesn't mean it's right. Relationships matter. I don't care what a challenger book tells you. I don't care what other podcasts and other blogs tell you. Relationships matter in sales, and you're trying to build a relationship. You cannot beat somebody down with an objection or walk away. So if they say, no, two weeks from now doesn't work well for you. Well, I'd love an opportunity to show you how WestJet can help. When are you going to be looking at this again? Oh, eight months down the line. Can I call you six months down the line just so that I can set up time with you? Yeah, that's fine. Now when I'm calling six months from now, because you put it in your CRM, hey, it's Mike from WestJet, just calling back as promised to see what we can do for you. That's great. So that's the way that I do the three-part process. I'm going to use the three words that every salesperson hates. Practice, practice, practice. Yeah. You know me, I, I'm a basketball fanatic. Yes. If you came to me, Pascal, and said, hey, Mike, I'm going to give you $80,000, $50,000, or whatever amount, to hit this half-court shot in a month's time, I'm going to go out there and practice. Most of our commission and our quotas are 50, 80 grand, or whatever it is out there, but we're not practicing in real life. So I literally would take a document, I, I do my Google Docs, and I'd write out, Time commitment. These are, that's the objection I'm going to get. How am I going to respond to it? I typed out what I would say. I know it sounds like a script. Guess what? Walking Phoenix did a script in The Joker, but it looked natural. I practiced it and practiced it over and over again until it sounded like a real conversation. Because guess what? Half the time what you write down doesn't sound good when you say it. Half the time when you write stuff down, it sounds good in writing, but it's way too long and too convoluted. I like brevity. Well, I you think writing it, writing it out helps you remember it as well. And I would say to your point of, you know, even when you're cold calling, just doing it consistently. Because I know for myself, if because you don't have to, maybe you don't do it for one or two or three weeks because you've got the sales coming in. Then when you have to get back in the saddle and do it, it's so much harder to get into it's it. It's just like going to the gym. If you skip a day or two, it's not going to kill you. It's fine. But the longer mm -hmm. you wait to get back into it. It's that just... muscle atrophies. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and when I say practice, I, you can be practicing out loud. You can say it to yourself. You know my lovely wife. She hates me for this, but I practice with her. I go down her and say, hey, honey, these are the five objective objections. Throw them out to me. Let me answer them. Or talk to your dog if you don't have someone at home. Oh, talk to your dog. Talk to your wall. <laughs> talk to, it does, the problem with practice is everyone goes, oh, I don't want to practice because you don't want to do it in front of your boss because you don't want to look like you don't know what you're doing. But the reality is, is that none of us are naturals. I love Les Brown. I don't know if everyone on here is a fan or know who he is. Les Brown is one of the best public speakers and orators of our time. And one person one time in an interview that I watched said to him, hey, Les, you're a natural. That's why you're so good at this. And his response was, no, I'm good at this because I work. I've never met a natural heart surgeon. Why do you assume I can be a natural at this? Oh, good response. So speaking of Les Brown, you're one of uh, three people I take book recommendations from all the time. So you, Mike <laughs> Knapp, our friend Graham Young, if one of the three of you says, hey, I read this good book, you have to read it. I don't even bother to ask what it's about. I'm on Amazon and I'm ordering that book because I know it's going to be amazing. Um, so anything 
that you'd recommend anything that you're reading right now you're probably reading two or three books at the same time can you give us one well i'll give you stuff exactly on the topic that we're talking about okay. and then we'll go into the, and then we'll go into our last one um the best book i've read on objections is just that title objections by jeb blount um he breaks it down in a way this is the book that i read to learn um i think it's a great book and it breaks it down into a very easy way of understanding the second book and this is coming from someone who went from finance to sales it's a book called exactly what to say by phil m jones it's literally probably the size of a pocket book i think it's only 120 pages but it's called the magic words for influence and impact and in my opinion the words we use matter Absolutely. and if you don't sound natural and if you don't sound confident you're not going to win in sales so when i joined we 100 percent when i when i joined sales i did as you know i did toastmasters i was a corporate finance person i didn't know how to talk in front of people i bought these books because i wanted to learn what are the right words to use so that when i'm in that situation i don't get hung up i would read articles on the industry that i'm trying to call what language are they using so i sound like an expert even though i didn't feel like it well, you are pre preparing to become a professional in what you're doing. So you're setting a very high standard for yourself and then doing whatever it took to get there. And so that's, that's a mindset thing. That's probably a topic for another guest. We don't have time today, but that is essential. I mean, you have to want it badly enough to do what it takes to get there, bottom line, right? And then I, yeah, 100%. And like you said, mindset is half of what you need. Um, the last one obviously is why are you getting objections in the first place? And I think that we don't do this enough and it's being completely objective and putting the mirror in front of you and saying, okay, this is what you're asking for. Would you take that meeting? Yeah. Would you accept that hour that you're asking for? Is an hour too much? Are you actually providing value? And I think if we are really truly honest with our ask, and we could refine it to a point where we said, yeah, you know what, that is creating value and that's going to get the meaning. You would find your objections going down drastically. And I think getting some outside feedback as well. So if you are, practicing, if you have a friend who said, look, this is what I do. Can you give me some pointers? Particularly if they're not in the industry, so they're looking at it purely from, are you credible? Are you convincing? Are you giving me a good reason? Um, that can be very helpful. So, uh, also just using natural, real language. Don't use jargon. Yeah, throw the jargon out because every industry has its own jargon, and people can get lost in it. And as I say, a confused mind always says no. Uh, don't make people feel stupid because they're not. <laughs> Hundred percent. So, thank you so much, Mike. Um, no problem. I hope it helped. Thank you. I, I'm sure, well, it helped me. I always learn from you. So I, I hope the audience feels the same way.